Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's seminar. I am Rai Sul Islam. I am a first year PhD candidate. My supervisors are Professor Mardi, Dr. Mala and Dr. Vlad. My thesis concentration is to examine the changing dynamics of interaction between financial markets during financial crisis periods. The objective is to be able to suggest beta markets, unique markets for investment and diversification. And this is the first work towards that objective titled International Financial Market Interconnectedness with Time Varying Spillover Index. In this paper, we try to examine the changing interaction between selected markets using time varying dynamic Diebold and Ilma's spillover index. The presentation is split into a few parts. First, I'm going to quickly talk about some literature in the, in the introduction, moving on to the questions that we aim to address, the method that we have applied, our results and findings, and finally some plan for future work. So to begin with, as Forbes and Rigobon defines, interdependence to be cross-market linkage due to a random shock, Collins and BIAC defines contagion to be reversal of net capital flow caused by such interdependence. Rodriguez suggests interconnectedness to be a bridge between two visions, via contagion and spillover. And there has been similar work in the field of spillover and market networks. Very recently, Esmoglu looks into systemic risk in financial networks, while Mala and Mardi examines the impact of monetary policy shock into the equity markets of Asian five economies. Mardi's contribution spans from contagion, spillover, to systemic risk and financial networks. And there has been some other works in uh, which examines interconnectedness in different markets. Now, while Rodriguez examines interconnectedness in 10 European sovereign bond markets, focusing on the European debt crisis, what is the originality of our work? What sets our work apart? First of all, much of the originality and novelty of the current work lies in the selection of the sample markets and their history connecting them together. As opposed to selecting the markets from randomly from developed and developing countries, our markets are coming from three different groups of countries. First of all, those countries which are going through severe transition and need access to liquidity. China, Australia, Singapore, Canada. Countries that are involved in war for over a long period of time and we want to see how their spillover characteristic has changed. Iraq, Kuwait, Israel and countries which were directly affected by the Asian financial crisis period and there was severe degree of policy intervention into the markets. So we want to see how these markets evolved over the last few years time. As opposed to focusing on uh, our uh, on a single index, although we uh, measure interconnectedness with equity index, we simultaneously include oil index and commodity index to see how much of the interconnectedness is being caused by oil inclusion and how much is being caused by commodity inclusion. That will allow us to look into more the direct and indirect transmission of shocks more closely. As opposed to focusing on a single event, our 14 years period of sample data covers at least 10 turmoil periods and we want to examine how our market's interdependence changes through all this financial crisis period. At the end, this should allow us to suggest a robust network of spillover between the markets. Now, how important uh, uh, these are the markets as we have seen there are eight emerging markets nine oil exporting countries markets and as usa and japan uh, as bank for international settlement suggests usa and japan to be conduits during different financial crisis periods we also include them how important this study is is something we know when we see how serious authorities are trying to stop 
such spillover entering to their markets. So, in the post-Asian crisis period, we know there was severe policy intervention into the markets. Malaysia reverses from floating to fixed exchange regime, while Indonesia uh, adopts inflation targeting policy, changing from managed float. Hong Kong bans short selling, while South Korean currency devaluation doubles. China and Singapore, on the other hand, were quite resistant during that period and did not put a lot of restriction into the markets. As suggested by Krugman, China's measure of total factor productivity increased from 11% to 40% in the preceding years, so that was quite credible. As Jones suggests, oil price movement in any direction will move stock prices. Aldini suggests, while oil price rise generally depress stock prices in the developed countries, it boosts the stock prices in oil exporting countries. So let's look into some Middle Eastern markets. We all know Saudi Arabia has the highest market capitalization in that region now. While Kuwait and Iraq were the oldest regulated market and Kuwait also experienced a historic shock in the 1980s and there was severe regulation intervention into the market. According to Kindleberger, nothing helped much due to three wars involving Kuwait and Iraq and the Iraq invasion. Several studies from 1990s till date suggest the Japanese and the Canadian stock markets are highly reliant on global oil price movement. And as Shen suggests, up until 1999, there was no visible benefit in diversification in the Latin American markets due to their high degree of integration. So the method. We have adopted Dibon and Ilmas propose hey step ahead for customer variance decomposition matrix, which suggests us, uh, which is also known as adjacency matrix and the connectedness matrix that suggests us own volatility spillover and cross volatility spillover. Fraction of error variance in forecasting I due to innovations in I itself is own volatility spillover, while fraction of error variance in forecasting J due to innovations in I is cross volatility spillover and henceforth spillover. Directional spillover uh, allows us to estimate net pairwise spillover, which is simply the difference between the directional spillover. So this is the variance decomposition matrix representation where E is the error vector which is 1 for I, 0 for the rest. A is the coefficient matrix of the infinite moving average representation from VAR. Summation is the residual variance covariance matrix whose standard deviation of the diagonal elements are represented by A. Now this is non-orthogonalized because the row sums don't add up to 1. So later more normalization approach was adopted at, e, at each element of the variance decomposition matrix well from the denominator you see by definition it's one how do you measure the uh, directional spillover you take the summation of the off diagonal elements excluding the diagonal elements when you do that by the row sums you have contribution from others when you do that by column sums you have contribution to others. The difference between directional spillover measures net pairwise spillover which simply allows you to look into more bivariate relationship between the markets. Now there is about 58 figures and 17 tables but I'm not going to bore you with uh, showing you all this rather I'm going to quickly show you some combination of the figures and moving on to telling you the story myself. So the first figure shows the markets which receive the highest shock from other markets from dynamic analysis. Those, those are Kuwait, Venezuela, Iraq and Sri Lanka. Now the second figure is quite interesting. As we can see in the post-Asian crisis period, China received the highest shocks from other markets and that continues even in the European debt crisis period as represented by the red signal. The blue signal represents Australia, which shows that Australia has always received moderate degree of shocks from the other before the global crisis, after the global crisis, post-Asian crisis, all through. 
from the yellow signal we see canada did not receive um, high shocks from other markets before but since 2010 canada started receiving very high shocks from other markets and that continues similar to china <clears throat> in terms of spilling shocks onto the other markets australia relative to usa do not spill any significant shocks onto the other markets while india even spills higher shocks compared to australia onto the other markets Saudi Arabia started spilling high shocks onto other markets in the post-Iraq invasion period, while before Iraq invasion, Iraq was spilling the highest shock from that continent onto the other markets. In terms of spilling shocks onto the other markets, China and Israel both spill significant amount of shocks onto the other markets. So what do we find from the full sample analysis? We see USA, Canada and Singapore transmits the higher shock onto other markets. While USA spills its higher shock onto Australia, it spills its lower shock onto Canada. On the other hand, Canada spills its higher shock back onto USA. Japan receives very high shock from USA, but it spills its higher shock onto Australia. Australia keeps receiving very high shocks from all other markets, but do not spill any high shocks onto the other markets. <coughs> In terms of receive. Uh, Spilling shocks, Philippines spill the lowest shock. From the dynamic analysis, we see in the post Asian crisis period, along with the Asian markets, Australia received very high shocks from Thailand. In the post global financial crisis, along with Australia, uh, Singapore, and New Zealand, uh, Malaysia also received very high shocks. And if you can recall from the figure, Iraq in the pre-Iraq invasion period was spilling the highest shock onto other markets while Malaysia during that period was receiving the highest shock. Malaysia being a Muslim majority country, it can be deduced that it was highly invested in the Middle Eastern markets and when the Middle East was spilling the higher shocks, it, Malaysia was receiving the shocks through USA while USA worked as a conduit. In the post-global financial crisis period, we have seen from the figures that China was spilling the high, uh, receiving the high shock from the other markets. If you can recall, in the post-Asian crisis period, China was quite resistant and did not uh, receive any high shocks from the other markets. But it seems like in the post-2007 period, in 10 years period with high degree of integration, Chinese market have weakened and it has become more vulnerable in terms of receiving of shocks. That is true for South Korea too. <clears throat> now, on the contrary, India and Philippines, both of the markets, very newly included in the emerging market section and was not heavily studied before, ha shows remarkable potential. While well, both of the markets receive high shocks from USA, they are able to adjust the markets very quickly. They both of them show quick mean reversion. And while Philippines was able to adjust its market, India was uh, able to spill higher shocks back onto the other markets. And that is remarkable. These markets might have the potential to become conduits themselves. If we look into Sri Lanka and Thailand, both of the markets transmit moderate degree of shocks onto other markets. However, uh, the times when they spill their shocks are the times when there is a local event. For Sri Lanka in 2004, there was um, political turmoil. In 2008, there was tsunami. For Thailand, the 2006 coup and 2007 tsunami are the periods when these markets spill their higher shocks. With robustness, we see in 2006, Australia spills its higher shock for the first time onto the other markets, along with India, as we have seen from the figures. We also see Canada in 2012 spills its higher shock onto other markets. Canada, being an oil exporting country, is expected it will spill its shock through oil indices, which it does. In 2010, Japan and Canada, both of the markets, spill very high shocks onto other markets. However, in 2012, Canada is not spilling a shock through the oil indices, rather, it's spilling a shock through equity index. And we have seen from the figures that in post-2010, Canada was receiving very high shocks from the other markets as well. Before that, it was not receiving any high shocks. So it seems like 
with high degree of integration with the equity market, the Canadian market, similar to China, has weakened. It has become more vulnerable in terms of receiving of shocks, while it's able to even spill high shocks onto other markets back. In terms of receiving of shocks, Australia and New Zealand, both of the markets, continue to receive shock. That doesn't change along with Malaysia. So as we already mentioned, with oil inclusion, we see Japan and Canada uh, transmits high shock. Canada's overall shock transmission increases. Now in 2002, we find Australia spills another high shock through oil inclusion. But as a commodity exporting market, it is expected that Australia will transmit its shocks through the commodity index. But with commodity inclusion, its overall shock transmission drops. So Australia actually spilled its shocks through oil index. And um, as oil exporting markets, it's expected the Middle Eastern markets will spill their shocks through oil index. But with oil inclusion, their overall shock transmission drops. So it seems like the Middle Eastern market are highly integrated to the global equity market and spilling their shocks through the equity indices. So finally, what do we find? First of all, there's an overall change in the degree of interconnectedness. We see markets that were stronger before has become we more weaker and vulnerable in terms of receiving of shocks, such as China, South Korea. We have seen markets who are newly included um, are showing remarkable potential in terms of receiving shocks but being able to adjust shock quickly and spilling shocks onto other markets back. We see Australia and New Zealand, due to their high degree of openness, continue to receive shocks, uh, which is alarming. It might be high time to think about restricting the markets a bit. We have found that oil exporting developed markets, which used to receive the least shock but spill the highest shock back onto other markets, that trend starts changing since 2010. Now, literally last week, we have included this uh, spillover networks between the markets uh, while the proximity of the nodes represent the degree of spillover between them in terms of receiving uh, uh, contribution of shocks to others this is the spillover network in terms of receiving of shocks from others this is the spillover network now this has just been included and requires further explanation exploration and examination so we're putting this into the planning phase so what's next? First of all, we want to examine science spillover measure and compare science spillover with Diabold and Elma spillover to see if there is any change in the degree of interconnectedness measures. We want to see uh, science spillover gives us the added advantage of measuring the magnification and dampening effects of positive and negative shocks. While Diabold and Elma spillover suffered from a weakness in treating with ill post data <clears throat> we want to see if with science spillover we can overcome that weakness and if we can bring in more ill post data more uh, weak countries and if we can do that we'll be able to suggest a bigger better network between spillovers maybe more robust one so in the third chapter now we already have a superior measure at hand, better measure at hand. We have a strong, robust network of spillover between the markets. We want to delve further into the interconnectedness between the markets to see how the transmission of shocks are happening between them. So we want to prove that if Malaysia receives the shocks from the Middle East through USA, in order to do that, we want to we need to examine the direct impact of innovations from uh, I to J and the indirect impact of innovations from I to J. For that, we will simultaneously include exogenous variables such as sovereign bonds, credit default source spreads, mutual funds, interbank liabilities to see how the interconnectedness between the markets are changing. This will allow us to finally propose a robust static spillover network between the markets or a, basically a network map between the markets. Now you may be wondering why these markets spillover characteristic react as they do. 
until we do the direct and indirect transmission study is very difficult to explain why the characteristics are as such or uh, we cannot claim scientifically these are the reasons but from recent uh, articles non-scientific articles in Forbes and Economist there we can put some light in into that discussion first let's think about India the Bombay Stock Exchange in terms of number of stocks listed is the highest in the world right now it has the largest number of stocks listed in a, uh, at a time so think about a pool and a pond if you throw a similar size stone in a pool it will make a bigger ripple effect than you do that in a pond so it's easy for the, the uh, Bombay Stock Exchange to receive shocks but it is easier for it to transmit shocks to the other markets with all these number of stocks listed. Australia on the other hand is changing from commodity exporting to more service oriented economy. For that it requires a lot of liquidity injection into the economy right now and Australia re requires access to liquidity. Australia stock stocks are included in Johannesburg dark pool trading system and electronic communication network uh, through which Australia is, stocks are being traded all over the world. This is bringing in very high liquidity into the economy, very high cash, but also bringing in shocks. That's no wonder. Now, that is go for that goes for Canada too. Canada's resources are drying up. It's moving towards more service-oriented industry. So it requires a lot of investment into the economy. It's bringing in liquidity through the exchanges, specifically from USA trading with USA shocks are coming in. China has a whole different story. The Chinese markets have aimed to move their productivity from know-how to more domestic innovation. Therefore, the R&D expenditure in China is currently the second largest in the world. The Chinese authorities have announced by 2050 it will lead the world in terms of domestic innovation. But for that objective to meet China requires high degree of cash right now into the economy is overall labor productivity is dropping while uh, its labor force is dropping the in 100 years China had the lowest GDP growth last year attaining 